Hello, this is Pastor Larson, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. We're recording on Saturday for broadcast on Sunday, and we are glad to have with us Judy and Jamie and Bobby and Chris and Jeannie. That's our, uh, <laughs> that's our welcome crowd to you. They're participating. I want to let you know that I'm going to try harder this week to watch for your, for your uh, raising of your hands. Uh, Chris, I apologize. Last week, I did not see you raise your hand, and I went right on by. So now I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to you, because I already know what's on the screen. All right. And we'll get started, all right, with a word of prayer. Lord God, you have come to us in your word, and then you came to us in your word made flesh, Jesus Christ, your Son. And in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so we rejoice this morning that you have given us a place among your people, a place where we can worship and study and learn what your requirements are, the just requirements of the law, and how Jesus Christ fulfilled that for us and suffered in our place for our failures to live up to your expectations. Grant that we will do so as we study your word and learn from the examples and the bad examples of the people you have recorded in your history books. In the name of Jesus Christ, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of all history, amen. amen. Well, uh, you know that the theme is expectations, and this morning or this afternoon or whenever you're watching, we're looking at Hannah's expectations, and then the priest, Eli, he has some expectations, and of course the Lord has some expectations. I'm going to say a word about um, that last one when we get uh, close to the end. The Zoom people have said that we are limited to 40 minutes last week. We were approaching that 40-minute limit, and then they gave us a reprieve and said, you can use it for longer. I don't know if that's going to happen today, but we'll just see. I will plan to, um, to stop this meeting somewhere around 9.35, and um, if we don't have to stop, well, we'll stop when the, when the slides are few and you are finished with your part in the discussion. I have expectations of you. My expectation is that you will join in the application questions and reflect uh, on your own lives and experiences. And as much as you want, uh, this is for you. It is much easier for us to do that when we're upstairs in the classroom. Now let's see how it works here. Expectations. This is the Sunday morning Bible class. Now, I don't know about the people uh, when they're at home, whether they're going to have that obscured, see? So. Yes, it is. On the right-hand side, we're miss I'm missing a little bit of it. Yeah. Because of well, that's, other That's about the best I can do. Okay. Let's go. Hannah made a vow, and you can recall from last week, from 1 Samuel 28, that Hannah has given her son Samuel into the Lord's service for life, for life. And I hope that you will open your Bibles occasionally. We'll have most of it on the screen to 1 Samuel 128. She had asked the Lord for a son, and he gave her Samuel. And then she made that vow. A vow must be kept. I will give him to the Lord. There's this sentence that I mentioned. Uh, would someone read 1 Samuel one twenty-eight off the screen? Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. That word lent, uh, we, when we lend something, we expect to get it back. Uh, you know, lawn tools. Uh, lent here means dedicated. It's given, and there's not going to be any turning back, not um, any reneging on the vow. But once a mother, always a mother, right, ladies? Yes. So <laughs> that's going to be our application. 
Hannah doesn't, however, abandon her son in any way. She loves him. She is of her own flesh. And therefore, she gives Samuel into the care of Eli the priest. Um, you're all unmuted. So if you want to jump into the conversation, just say so, and I'll, we'll all hear you. Eli is going to care for Samuel. And he's going to be Samuel's support and guide, his teacher, and a kind of a foster father. Samuel is entered in, entering into what might be called an apprenticeship. An apprenticeship. And we have to know that Samuel is in the lineage of Levi, and therefore Samuel, although he is not eligible to be a priest, and he doesn't become a priest, he is eligible to serve in the tabernacle as one of the Levites. Mm. Now, we're going to wonder if Hannah has already become aware of how poorly Eli's sons have been raised. And that's going to be the issue when we're getting close to our study this morning. But here's what I want us to remember. Hannah gave Samuel to the Lord, not to Eli. And there's a great deal of trust. This is a woman of great faith. So I'm going to ask you some questions uh, and chime in here if you have something to say. Have you ever dedicated or promised or given something up and then later regretted having done so? Someone or something. Can you think of anything that you gave up that you wish you had back? <laughs> no? Yeah. Yes, well, um, we did some cleaning up around here um, this past few weeks and uh, put some things into storage. And um, my son got rid of all of our VCR equipment and all of the tapes and... While I didn't watch them often, I kind of regret that because some of them were tapes of them when they were little children. And oh, now I won't have that. They're lost forever? Yeah, so the trash took them away. They're somewhere in a, in a dump. Uh, I, uh, we had some tapes on reel-to-reel, seven-and-a-half-inch reels of tapes of our very young children that are gone also. Anybody else give up something, lose something? We're really not talking about something you lose in a storm here. It's when you give it up. So from time to time, we may make a vow and then promise, and then maybe we have second thoughts. I hope you never, ever have that about an offering you make to the Lord. What are the possible complications of leaving a vow unfulfilled? Making a promise to God. Uh, he might not be there for you when you need him. <laughs> I, the <laughs> Lord will never go back on his promises. Uh, his vows to us are in, I, I don't know, recorded in the blood of Jesus is the best way I can put it. They are, they are firm. Mm-hmm. His covenant is not ever eliminated. So if we leave a vow unfulfilled, uh, maybe we need to talk to God about that. I mean, it could even uh, be—it could be as serious as our salvation is—is uh, is hanging in the. Um, of the as long as we don't have uh, the the refusal to accept the forgiveness that God offers in Christ. We're not on a bad thing there. Good morning, Evelyn. Welcome. So here's a quote from an 18th century clergyman named Joseph Benson. None are losers by what they dedicate to the Lord or employ in such a manner as is pleasing in his sight. You don't lose when you give to God. 
Anyone else on, on these ideas? <coughs> We're not as agenda driven this morning. If we don't finish all the slides, well, you know what happens in, in the classes that I have. Hannah had expectations, didn't she? I've lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. So what thoughts and emotions might have been going through her mind and her heart when she handed him over to Eli, this small child? He is probably two or three years old because um, the weaning of a child did not take place until two or three years. So she told her husband, um, I'm going to wean him and then I'm going to give him to the Lord. And he said, do what is best in your sight. So what is, what is she thinking? What is she feeling at that moment? I would think she's feeling a great deal of loss. Um, loss? Loss uh, of having that sweet child with her. I mean, mothers love their children, and that's a very young age. And having nursed him, none of us men know that what, that is like to have that bonding that goes on between mother and child. Well, we know, we also know that she waited such a long time uh, to have him. She was barren for so long. I mean, just to be blessed to have the child, there were years and years that she waited for this pregnancy and child. Right, right, right. She was barren and then she received a child and immediately gave him up. Bobby, you had a comment. Well, I have a question regarding verse five. Um, she was barren, has borne seven children, but she who has had many son pines away. Um, I was led to believe that Hannah only had one child, and it was Samuel, and had given him up. And but does it not that you you don't have favorites? But did she have six more children then later? She yes. had she had five more, and we're going to get to that later. Oh, okay. Glad you brought it up now because. When I read her prayer, I was looking at that seven as the number of completion rather than a literal uh, number of children that she has had. And did she write and say this prayer at this moment in between 1 Samuel 1 and 1 Samuel 1, 11? It's inserted there and she prays it. I think it is in general However, that's my take on it. Okay. I, I was just going to say not that giving up um, a, a, any child uh, is, is, is challenging for um, uh, a parent. And, and not that, and, and, and she still sees him too, of course, and, and will be able to worship with him. But uh, um, I don't know if it makes it a little bit easier having some more children too. But um again i i don't know just i was just pondering that a little bit she goes to the priest eli and eli gives her a blessing and it becomes a promise that she is to have other children right? okay that's uh, that's coming up have you ever had to or decided to give up something or someone very precious to you here, I'd like to talk about the someone, if you would. If it's too personal, then I understand. Well, my son, Philip, was um, uh, a teenager. Um, he got into some trouble at school, and he went to live with a friend of mine for a little while. <clears throat> and when it was time for him to come back to me, he chose not to, but to go back to her home. Um, that was very difficult for me to, to give up my child. Um, but uh, he, he would not listen to anything I had to say. And I felt that maybe it was in his best interest to, to stay with someone he was at least going to sure. um, take care of him. And the Lord knows all of that, doesn't he? And he has some expectations and some care for your 
your son. So you entrust your child to the Lord, no matter where or when. So what about the times when your child went away to school or to military service or to be married? And you know how families are scattered now. Isn't that hard? I would say it, it must be. Um, I would say it must be for those parents. Uh, my children, uh, my younger two children, haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> They're all still with me. So if I, they've never gone away, away. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I can't say that I have experienced that per se, going away to school. But um, uh, for a while, Stephen lived apart from me. Uh, I always was worrying about him because I never felt he was making good choices. So okay. that was very worrisome to me. Let's go on to the next screen uh, about Hannah's expectations. What expectations do you think she has? Now, number one, she probably, because she knows she is going up with her husband and what family that they have, her husband's other wife and their children. They're going up every time at this time of the year and perhaps two other times for worship and sacrifice as we're going to see a little later. So she expects to see Samuel. But as far as the wide ranging expectations, when you see a newborn child, or even a three-year-old child, and you look at that child, maybe you're thinking of a grandchild right now, what is he or she going to be? You, you can't know. She could not possibly see how faithfully Samuel is going to fulfill his offices as prophet and judge. Eli, Eli might have some expectations, but we don't know what communication takes place in that exchange and that handing over. But we know from reading 1 Samuel that Samuel is going to be a prophet and the last of the judges. And so Hannah prays. I suggested last week that you read this over for yourself. We're not going to spend verse by verse study of it today. But just to not leave out the prayer, I will look at it. What, what Hannah prayed was, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let's... Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Well, that's kind of a wolf, and some think that that is against her husband's other wife. <laughs> I don't know. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. But those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. That theme is repeated at other times in the scriptures. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. Sheol can mean the grave. It can simply mean the place of the dead. Or she all can be the place where God's judgment is meted out upon all the unbelievers. The Lord kills with the law and he brings to life with the gospel. He raises up. On the last day he will raise up me and all believers and give unto me and you and all believers eternal life. This is most certainly so. I'm quoting Martin Luther. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. 
Now, some say that that is prophecy of Samuel, but she can't know that yet in detail. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on him he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. The horn is the, the place of strength. It's not the horn of an animal. There's the horn of the altar. Comments, anyone? Chris. You had asked the question of, of uh, who was she writing it to, but I think she was writing it to herself because she didn't have guilt. She did what she promised. So therefore she was free and, and, and exhilarated by the fact that she had done what she promised. And, and that would be a good feeling rather than not doing what you promise and have guilt. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I think uh, there is something in that. I'm going to ask you all to, uh, to speak up when you uh, speak because it is difficult to hear in this environment. All right. Let's go on with the narrative. And I can see we're not going to finish all of the slides today, and that's okay. So what do you think? Hannah prayed for a son. The Lord answered her prayers. Would she not also continue to pray often for Samuel and for Eli? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. So let's put that on us. No guilt here. This is encouragement. How might we be praying for the blessings and the mighty needs of our children and grandchildren? whether nearby or living far from us. The reason I am reacting to that is while I'm clicking the slide, I get some uh, text messages from Garrett, who is trying to decide when and whether to go back to his job location in New York City. Mm. Jay, tough decision. So we are praying for Garrett. Anybody else want to share on this note? Uh, Janie, you can look at the texts a little bit later, please. Raised hand by <laughs> Bobby, what do you have to do? I'm practicing it. I know that we don't have a lot of people here. All right. But um, I do have some good news to share with everyone that ties in with this. Um, but I'll just, before I say that good news, um, we've had a number of good Zoom meetings with uh, family, and um, I've, I've tried to do it with uh, both my father's brother's family, and uh, we hadn't always talked to them all the time. So uh, we've, we've heard a lot of good news and touched base with a lot of people with, who were all out of Florida, up north, uh, up in Michigan, and, and I have family in New Jersey, Massachusetts, Iowa. And even I had a, a one on my other side of the family with uh, Germany and Seattle. Um, so, but uh, the good news that I have is, uh, you know, I pray for all my nieces and nephews, but uh, I'm going to become a grandfather first, uh -huh. for the first time. Uh -huh. Congratulations. Congratulations. You a grandfather at that young age? <laughs> <laughs> I know. But uh, I, I'm trying to get my daughter to be a little bit more active in church, too, or trying to get her down in St. Paul. She lives in Boca, and she works at Copper Point Brewery, uh, but she, uh, and she stopped drinking beer. <laughs> so she's 25, and uh, it's going to be her first child uh, January 15th. So well, we're looking forward to that. What's her first that. name? Her first name is Kayla, K-A-L-A-H. She went to Trinity from Trinity. kindergarten to eighth grade. Well, Kayla, Kayla Louise, uh, Kayla Clem, actually her last name is, um, she just got married last year, right after Dorian, 
a, a, be, a beach wedding rather than in the church. And she, uh, uh, her last name is Morrison, Kayla Morrison. Well, we'll add Kayla to our prayer list, okay? Would you do that, Thank please, you. guys? Anna prayed for a son. So we're praying for our children and grandchildren. There's a lot of praying to do. Um, you know, when they travel, when, when we know they're traveling, that's usually, uh, or when they're trying to make a decision. Well, usually the time that I pray for my grandchildren. Expectation applications. Well, here is uh, something to weigh in our hearts. What are some of the God-given expectations telling us what parents owe their children? You don't have to look up Ephesians 6 right now, but just off the top of your head, what are some of God's expectations for us? Even though our children are grown in some cases. I was going to say, I think guidance, um, respect, um, listening to them because uh, as they get older, um, they have different views than we have in life on all sorts of things, political, spiritual, and uh, we don't want to alienate them, but we want to also try to listen and guide them as best as we can. Is that hard? Extremely oh, yeah. hard. Yeah, extremely hard. When we're raising children, we're taught Ephesians 6, 1 to 4, parents do not provoke, or fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is, this is right. That harsh, uh, that not harsh, but that, that, that stern and clear law is always before us. But as you say, when they're grown, you don't have that leverage. I don't know that there's any certain age in the Bible where suddenly they're on their own, but they're sure, as you said, Judy, they're on their own. Now, how have modern day parents failed to fulfill God's expectations? Yeah. Any examples of modern day parents failing to do what God expected of them? I don't think that uh, we do, uh, I know, I don't think I have at any rate, uh, done uh, enough teaching uh, with, my, uh, with my children. I try to do a little bit more with my grandchildren, but um, uh, I think that uh, it, it creates questions in their mind when they don't have a clear basis to start from. Uh, and sometimes I think that uh, even though my children went to Trinity for a time from the time they were in pre-K until they were in third and fifth grade, I still feel like they got the basics, but um, they didn't necessarily take them to heart. Isn't that a problem for every Christian? Yeah. We know our failures and we confess them and we receive forgiveness. The repentance, the changing of the life of our lives to correspond with the change in our heart, that's the hard part. And I think if our children uh, they're having the same problem. Go ahead, Bobby. Well, I don't want to interrupt what you were, your chain of thought there. Um, but I will say that, uh, and you, you've seen it a little bit. I, I'm a sports official, and I love sports. I think it's a great a activity. But uh, the demands on sports on our children, and or I see on a lot of other children, uh, it, it takes away from, you know, involvement in, in church and, and activities that are uh -huh. uh, that are going on, you know, Saturdays and Sundays. And All the tournaments, uh, yeah. Tournaments, yeah. You're, I know your son would maybe play basketball tournaments on Sunday. And my daughter played uh, volleyball tournaments. I always used it as an opportunity to try to go to a Lutheran church at a tournament 
And you know, I remember we had one Easter that I went and it was uh, up in Atlanta. I really enjoyed uh, going to an Easter service up there, but um, I, I, I try to think of that as a ministry too, but uh, that's another. Yeah. Another it's thing, it's yeah. difficult to, to walk uh, that line between keeping the Sabbath in the literal way or saying, uh, guys, uh, let's do a little devotion in our room before we go to this morning's game. I don't know. <laughs> we went through travel basketball too, <laughs> all over the state, and uh, it was a real uh, challenge. How about your grandchildren? Any expectations you've got for your grandchildren? I'm sure you do. Any you want to mention? Chris? Well, I want to go back to uh, the second point, how modern day parents fail to fulfill God's expectations. And, and I'm not talking from the point of view of someone of myself. I'm talking about all the children that are left, uh, foster homes or just left. And that has got to be a, a terrible stain on them and uh, uh, in the world, actually. Yeah, that's, that's a real issue, isn't it? And when they're shuttled from one home to another and then to another, there's there's no so, uh, solid ground there. And if if these aren't Christian homes, then then what happens? We will have to entrust them to the Lord and hope. Now, I, to you, children, I'm going to say that we're coming up on on 40 minutes. And if we get cut off, I'm going to um, say that that is, no, we didn't get cut off at 40 minutes, so. No, there was, a, there was a little note that came up, Pastor, that said you were given unlimited time. I didn't see that. Thank you for that. Oh, all right, very fine. Let's go on then about the, um, Samuel is going to begin his service, even as a small boy. But in order to get the entire narrative of Samuel in focus, we're going to skip over the parts about Eli's sons. There is a reason for them to be interleaved with Samuel, and I'll give you that reason right now. And that is, there's a great contrast between the sons of Eli and Samuel. And you can read that if, in, in sequence when you read chapter 2 of 1 Samuel by yourself. I do encourage you to read the text from your Bibles before and or after our, our study uh, here in the Zoom room. Samuel was advancing in years and in faith, and he was gaining the education and the training, and this is going to make him fit. It's going to outfit him to serve under Eli's supervision, and then later, after Eli's death, we're going to see the tremendous man <laughs> that God has made of him. Yet, please remember that Samuel is still a Ne'ar, a boy, and in the scriptures, and the Hebrew that is used for anyone up to 15 years. Now, you can see if he was three or four, for 11 or 12 years, he is going to be under that supervision. And I don't know at what year this little Levite will fulfill all the other ministry applications and uh, things that Eli has trained him to do. The details aren't given us. But let's see what Mama is up to. And this is beautiful. <laughs> uh, how many seamstresses have we in our uh, Zoom room today? Not me. A little bit here. A little bit? A little bit. I know that you're, you've are you been doing uh, quilts, Judy. I know Jane. I've been doing quilts and masks. Masks, yeah. So here's a seamstress by the name of Hannah. She was ministering before the Lord. Samuel was ministering before the Lord. A boy clothed with a linen ephod. That's a garment worn around the waist, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. 
this boy is growing and he's going to need a new robe every year. And she didn't buy it at JC Penney's. You know, I don't think we can fully appreciate what it was like to make everything, everything by hand, or to go to someone who is skilled in whatever trade and ask for it to be made and sold. The robe and ephod of white linen were probably commonly worn, it says in one of the commentaries, by the Levites in their ordinary service in the tabernacle. I don't know whether he would have been outfitted uh, by someone else, but here is her loving service. And a great excuse to come and see how much her boy has grown. Isn't that wonderful? Did Hannah expect this? And here's the answer to your question, Bobby. Eli would bless Han Elkanah and his wife, both of them, and say, may the Lord give you children by this woman, in contrast to your other woman. Good morning, Corolla. Did Hannah expect this? Oh, this is this is Sunday's Bible class, last Sunday. Well, you're welcome to join us if you want. We're reading from 1 Samuel 2.20. Eli, the priest, blessed Elkanah and his wife. May the Lord give you children by this oh, woman no. for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. I just cannot do it. I'm going to try Would again. you like to join us, Corolla? Yes. Okay. Well, you are there. Uh, comment, join in, questions, anytime. Then Eli answered, go in peace, the God of Israel grant you your petition you have made to him. So you see that the petitions and the blessings are very similar. Now, when Hannah goes home this it's time. Just, I think last year, I think it's last week. Open, open Zoom meetings. Yes, well, that's how you got here. See, Pastor Larson seems to listen to me. <laughs> Pastor Larson, I'm so wanting to get into your Saturday 10 a.m. Bible study. You, you are right now. Yes, but I cannot see you or listen to you. I just cannot get through it. And I'm on the telephone with Michelle Ehlers, who's trying to help me. Well, I can't help you now. Let us uh, please go on with the class and whatever help you can get there. And then we can talk afterward if you like. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll see what we can do. Thank you. Okay. So, well, you can listen. I, I will. Okay. Are so we... now Hannah goes home this time with a God-given expectation, and that is, I'm going to have more. Are you children. listening to it, Michelle? It's, it's plural. Give you more children. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah. You know the word in the Bible is not, uh, knock on the door thing. and come in. Think it's last For the Lord to visit is to come and give his blessing, whatever the blessing will be. The Lord visited Hannah and yeah, she but I think it's last bore son. three sons and two daughters. I'm, I'm making him and the boy Samuel grew in the presence you, of the Lord. As you are praying. Uh, expectancies fulfilled. I think to mute, this please. was last Sunday. Yeah. So that's what the Lord did. And this is um, when we're talking about prayer in general, her expectations are the same as ours when we pray and ask God's will to be done among us and for us and for those we love and those we're trying to love. What did Jesus promise us? Would someone read Luke 2, uh, 638 there from the screen? Luke. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken also, together, right? running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Amen. I think far Thank more prayers uh, are answered than we know. 
remember people by name in your prayers. Exactly. Let's do that. In the meantime, are you, are you listening to the Bible study right now? Yeah. Oh, you didn't. We're, we're having the Bible study. It's being recorded. And then you can watch the whole Bible study tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Well, on, if, on the if yeah. Website. Okay. Okay. So, so let us go evidently on. Evidently, you were able to do it. That's the good thing. He's talking to Michelle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what expectations do you have when you pray? <laughs> I just cannot, I cannot focus I usually, well. I usually uh, because now I'm getting pray that, uh, that the Lord uh, certainly would answer the prayers. But uh, I think for me, it's always, um, I'm so impatient. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I want that, I want that quick answer. And I know it takes years sometimes for um, hearts to be changed. So, um, it just it's it's a time it's a time uh, thing that's difficult for me when I you know ask I guess and to keep asking and not and not get disappointed and stop asking. There's no limit. We don't get just uh, three prayers a day and then you have to quit. There's no limit to God's patience to listen to us and to answer in due time. And then when time takes longer, then the prayer for patience is the obvious one. Those are your expectations that God hears and that he answers. And his answers are not always what are on our minds. So here's this Eli, a husband and a father and a priest. When we think of Eli the priest, we sometimes forget that he also has two other roles, husband and father. He is a priest in the service of the Most High God. He is a descendant of Aaron. And in order to be a priest, you have to be a descendant of Aaron. Aaron, the elder brother of Moses, who was the first high priest installed by God. So Eli served in the tabernacle. And God had many expectations of his priests. Now for the sake of, uh, no, we're not there yet. The expectation that we have for Eli is that he would serve as priest until the Lord took him home. It was a lifetime appointment, like a Supreme Court judge. You have to die in office. You die with your boots on. <laughs> there are no retirement plans for the priest. Do not Jump into the present century, people. Not, not now and not yet, okay? His sons would follow him into the priesthood. That is, they would not necessarily be, be high priests, but they would be priests after him. That's his expectation when they're born. And the line of God's priesthood would continue according to his promise. Now, we know when it ends. I'll get to that later, or next week. See, we're into 51 minutes now since the meeting started, and uh, I'm going to have to decide when to stop here. The Levitical priesthood. I have six slides on this, on this priesthood, and I'm not going to cover them now. Two, three, four, five, six expectations that God had for those he chose as priests. They shall be called holy to their God and not profane the name of their God, for they offer the Lord's food offerings, the bread of their God. Therefore, they shall be holy. They shall not marry a prostitute or a woman who has been defiled, neither shall they marry a woman divorced from her husband, for the priest is holy to his God. From Leviticus 21. Continuing the quotes from Leviticus 21, God's high expectations. He shall not let the hair of his head hang loose, nor tear his clothes. He shall take as his wife a virgin of his own people. No blemishes, injuries, mutilations, blindness, and so forth. And there are additional requirements in the next chapter of Leviticus. Hmm. I want to emphasize uh, before you this morning, this afternoon, whenever you're watching, 
this is not a job. This is not something you apply for at the uh, help wanted uh, station of the state in which you live. God has very high expectations of his priests, and he has a right to have high expectations of his priests. And uh, when they fail, it's a major, major failing. So I want you to see what's going to happen in the light of the Leviticus requirements. It's called the Levitical priesthood for a reason. And the priests in the New Testament, I think we're familiar with them. I'm not going to cover this slide this morning for the sake of time. Eli's expectations, uh, when his sons Hophni, Hophni and Phineas. I can't help but think of Phineas T. Bluster on the Howdy Doody show in the 1950s. <laughs> I didn't know you spelled it that way. When they were born, Eli would have had no reason to doubt they would follow him into the priesthood. Eli knew the Lord's will for priests. He knew Leviticus 21 and 22 and all the rest. And as both their father and their priest, Eli had God's explicit command to raise his sons according to God's command and promise. The law and the gospel were still there. They've always been there. It didn't take Martin Luther or C.F.W. Walther to discover the law and the gospel. They were there all the time, just for the picking. So here we have God's command and promise for the two children that are born of Eli and his wife. But the expectations were unfulfilled. This is a sad part of the chapter. So we have got two things. Number one, Eli's performance as father and priest. And number two, we have the disobedience of his children, Hophni and Phinehas. They were priests of the Lord. But the scriptures describe them as being worthless and wicked, scoundrels, evil, ungodly. That Those are all translations of one Hebrew word. They had no regard for the Lord. And what is the evidence of their having no regard for the Lord? Their behavior. And we can look at those passages in detail um, next week. Um, I don't have time to... Uh, put them before you. I'm going to say an hour is enough. You know, there's some people that are going to watch this, and uh, I think they will think an hour is enough. <laughs> and um, you can only listen for so long. I'm talking about you this morning. They were worthless men. They, don't, they didn't know the Lord. And then they were stealing from the Lord. When any man offered a sacrifice, the priest servant would come, and while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Now that sounds okay, because the Lord did provide for the priests to eat how do you think the Levites had anything to eat? Well, they did have land around their 28 cities, but they also, the priests who served in the temple as priests, they received a portion of the sacrifice to eat. But here was the problem. And this is what it, the, the, how the wickedness of Eli's sons comes uh, to, to be shown to us. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat to the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, well, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish. He would say, no, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. 
if someone gives you a piece of meat that is raw, you get to roast it with the fat on it and enjoy. I don't know if you had a sirloin steak uh, in, in the recent few months, but when you broil a steak with the fat on it, you get that smell that drives your neighbors crazy. <laughs> or you, when your neighbor is broiling outside. Well, they weren't supposed to eat the fat. There's a requirement in the Old Testament that you give the fat to the Lord. You burn it. You roast it. And he has that sweet-smelling sacrifice. Well, the Lord doesn't have nostrils, and he isn't a, a man that, that, that has that. But you see, in order for the Lord to communicate to us, he uses something that we have, the olfactory organs in our face, our nose, to tell us this is what it is like. And the Lord wants that. You give it to the Lord. Yeah. So they were supposed to take the meat that was out of the kettle. And um, these two wicked sons were insisting they get theirs first. Do you see the basic idea here without going into any more detail? Questions? Comments? So that's what they were doing, and it was evil in the sight of the Lord. The meat with the fat was to be roasted first, giving the fat portions to the Lord as part of the sacrifice. And when they stole the meat portion before it had been roasted, it was a crime, a robbery committed at the altar. This sin was very great in the sight of the Lord. And it shows how Hophni and Phinehas disregarded the law, selfishly demanded meat for which they had no right, and desecrated the altar and the sacrifice belonging to God. The offerings God's people gave to him, they gave to him. And it was robbery to take that. Well, I must stop now because the hour is up, and I am going to thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, put you back on here and um, stop the share. He looked very good. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Things, uh, notifications come on my screen without my asking for it. The Lord bless and keep you. We're going to go back over some of these slides next week, so don't fret if you didn't get everything. Go back and read First Samuel and, um, and chapter 2. And what I'm going to do here is bring this back on so that we can say next week, <laughs> this is not going to be true anymore. Same. Next week we plan to finish the second chapter. Well, that's still true. And we're going to get into chapter 3 if there's time, because Samuel is going to hear a message from God about the future of Eli and his sons. And he's not going to want to tell Eli about it. Did I whet your appetite? Yes. Yes. We're on YouTube on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, uh, or live at uh, it's called the premiere when they show it the first time at 10 o'clock, and you can watch anytime. Invite your friends and neighbors and family to watch and listen to your comments. And I want to remind you that our worship is at 8.30 and 10.30. You can come in person, do the mask and the safe distancing thing, or you can participate in our broadcast live at those times, 8.30 and 10.30, uh, by going to trinitydelray.org slash live or you can watch anytime afterward on the YouTube channel. This is a wonderful thing we've got, but I still miss being upstairs in the conference room. Uh, yes. I could ask for your prayers. It will be that my physician will release me uh, from uh, homebound to, to go there with you, and that, more important than that, that one day 
you will all feel safe enough to go to uh, 400 North Swinton and, and join us in person. I really want that to, to, to happen. May the Lord bless our prayers to that end and, and uh, your service and your faith in the Lord's sight. The Lord bless and keep you until we meet again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.